Hello. Hey, how are you doing, man? How are you doing? Okay, two things. I've just got to get my phone charger and take it back upstairs with me because otherwise this phone will run out. Secondly, your name's Anarka, is that right? Yeah, that's my, well, it's my stage name, I guess you want to call it, but my, my formal name is Brandon. I'll call you Anarka then because that's what you call yourself. Thank you, I like Man, I'm, this is a dream come true to talk to you, man, seriously. What, you've you, you had dreams about doing this? Do what? <laughs> you've had dreams about doing this? No, I said, it's, uh, there's, there's a, there's a <laughs> list of people who I've always wanted to talk to and meet, and you're one of them, just because your music has just made such an impact on my life that I've never been able to oh, see Culture uh, Shock. Thank you very much. Of course. I've never been able to oh. see the humans, Culture Shock, or Fish live, but I hope one day I get to. Well, yeah, so do I. <laughs> um, although there's more chance of seeing subhumans over there than it is seeing um, culture shock or citizen fish. But uh, one's as good as the other. I was going to ask, and I should know this, but I don't. How come, uh, so, I know citizen fish and culture shock are both ska bands, but how come two bands? How do you mean two bands? Like um, Culture Shock and Citizen Fish, um, like Subhumans is more hardcore punk, and the other two, like, uh, like w what's the story? Obviously, why they're different, different musically. Um, they're different musically because, uh, let's see. Well, while the Subhumans were going on, there was the emergence of Two Tone and the Scar scene that was coming on at the same time, and um, it was very intellectual music. I'm not quite into it. Um, the background music playing at parties during the 80s wasn't all punk rock, there was a lot of reggae and dub and ska going on. Also, which I enjoyed listening to. So, when the story was split up in 85, um, and I was asked if I wanted to sing for a band that wasn't quite formed yet, because Nige uh, had a mate of his called Paul moving up from Cornwall to Bath, who was a really good bass player and was well, well into his dub reggae. So I thought, yeah, I'd give it a go. So, yeah, it was a different music because A, there's different uh, influences in the background of punk rock, and B, um, it was different musicians to the subhumans. I mean, completely different, and they were yeah. into playing a mixture of ska and reggae. And I just got totally into singing along to it. There's more space for the words to fit into. So I could sing slower for a change. I could actually be tuneful if I was able to, you know. So there's good space in ska and reggae that I haven't really dealt with work with whatever the phrase is before um, so then Comstock split up and then Sins of Fish involved two ex-members of the subhumans Phil and Trotsky so there was bound to be a more of a subhumans element to the music but we kept the scar and mixed it with more punk rock stuff and that's how Sins of Fish ended up with that sound which is kind of all over the place between the scar and punk and a few layers in between it was um it was good to be free to play whatever sort of music we actually felt like on the yeah. day. Without having to think, we're, we're definitely a ska band, we're definitely a punk band. Just like, we're a band, we do this and we do that. People like it or they don't, they don't really matter. I love all three of your bands. Um, another question is, I think what I was actually also trying to ask is, how did you come up with the name Citizen Fish in the Culture Shock? Um, let's see, Citizen Fish... Um, it was because our roadie was into Judge Dredd comics at that time, and it was Citizen This and Citizen That, and I like fish, <laughs> not eating them or killing them and all that stuff, but actually just the nature of fish. So, yeah, you know, Citizen This, Citizen That, ah, Citizen Fish. That's awesome. sort of futuristic and, and odd, and uh, yeah, so didn't think about it too hard, and it's not a bad name. Could be a better one. All names could be better, but this one could have been worse. I quite liked it. Uh, Culture Shock. Um, we just like the words culture and shock and we sort of played around with them. It's going to be shock culture at one point. But we set up a culture shock. Um, it just sounds like a good name, and it, and it is. Uh, unfortunately, it's so good that at least seven other culture shocks were in existence at the same time. There was a Scottish thrash band. There was a band in Holland. We turned up at a gig uh, somewhere in Holland. And, you know, obviously culture shock were playing. And we start playing, and like within three songs, half the crowd is like laughing. It's like, whoa, what are we doing wrong here? And it turns out that the culture shock who lived, the band who lived in that same town, did, uh, what was it, Jimi Hendrix covers? It's like, we were not what they came to see at all. Oh, it's God. Like, oh, shit. Yeah, heaps of culture shock. There's one in Australia, I think, uh, one in 
Canada, a couple in the States. What was a thrash band? Damn. Oh, it was a long time ago. I can't kind of forget the details. But yeah, Cold Shot was a very popular name. And even these days, there's a guy doing drum and bass, calls himself Culture Shock. <laughs> and we, we keep getting mixed in with him. We're, our, one of our albums is listed under his name, Culture Shock, on like Spotify, for instance. It's like, all oh, right, that's weird. Mm-hmm. Not only it gets more plays because of that. But it makes it harder for people to actually track it down. Anyway, I digress. Um, I, I just recently, and by recently, I mean about a month and a half ago, Alternative Tentacles, they were having a wholesale thing, and I bought like 50 CDs, and um, I've never really been a fan of Subhumans Canada. It's just, they're just, nothing against them, they're just not my cup of tea. But Biafra tossed their CDs in there, I didn't even buy them. And I noticed a sticker that said, Subhumans Canada, the original Subhumans. Is there, was there like a rivalry between the two Subhumans or something? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, the only contact we ever had with them was uh, 20 years ago where they asked in a letter if we could um, possibly put UK after our name if we went and played in America so we wouldn't get mixed up. Uh, oh. There was an idea of us doing a gig together, but for some, sort, some reason or other, it couldn't happen. Uh-huh. Um, they were, they are the original. They were the subhumans before we were. Just that they were in Canada, we were in the UK, and this was before any of us had ever got on an airplane and flown anywhere <laughs> at all. And Canada to us was like literally the other side of the world, different planet, yeah. different universe. So it didn't matter that we we picked the same name as another band who was so far away. Um, so we stuck with it, and then we heard they split up because that often got put in jail for this, that, and the other. And we thought, oh well, then, then they reformed. It doesn't matter. It's, I mean, there's quite a lot of bands. Yeah, and there's, name there's and probably even band. there's probably twenty bands named Subhumans humans out there, and you know, um, I, I wanted to talk about one of my favorite songs from the Subhumans, from the Cradle to the Grave, because I know it's the inspiration for No Effects's decline, but I can't count the number of like, how did y'all record that? That's a masterpiece. The same way as. <laughs> Same way as any other song when you start, you know, the, all the way through to the end. Um, how did you? How did we invent it? It might be a more apt. Question. Yeah, that's it, a, it that's took a, a few weeks of practices. Yeah, to nail it all together. Basically, I'd written this long, long, long song, um, and I said to Bruce, "Look, I've got this song, but like, it's miles long." <laughs> and he said, "Okay." But he, he just came up with a bunch of tunes that he had that he hadn't done anything with. I and mean, just basically, over the weeks of practicing, practicing like once a week, whatever, um, we just nailed them all together in different sequences. Nice. And came up with the basic tune. I, I was fitting the lyrics as we went along. It's like, okay, why don't we have a stop here, a bit more music, and then come back here with another verse, and then come into this beat, and it just we just worked at it, and then repeat the beginning towards the end, so we can like, like nicely round off, you know, it fades in, it fades out. Um, yeah, I love the change up yeah, on it. Unlike uh, there's a few other punk bands who have done dinosaur long songs. Like I love the decline; it's good. <laughs> but there's some other bands who don't do it as good as you and Fat Mike, and it's just I can listen to From the Cradle to the Grave over and over again just because it's you keep the song very interesting, and there's never a dull moment in it. And there's even some metal solos in that. Oh yeah, there's a bit of that with this in quite a few of I mean, we were all teenagers before punk rock came along, so we were bound to be liking something, but later on got described as being, well, that's just too heavy or too hippie or too flowery or whatever. I mean, that, the music we were brought up on, the best of it was like Black Sabbath, uh, David Bowie, and I, then I, the list is pretty short, you know. On the, um, yeah. the guitarist, Bruce and, Bruce and Phil were into their Hawkwinds, uh, King Crimson and stuff like that. Oh, and then punk rock came along just blew it all out of the water because suddenly it's all very fast and they were singing about something you could relate to yeah. and what's not to like exactly uh you're split with leftover crack um De- i think it's called deadline right or no it's citizen, it's citizen fish with leftover crack right yeah um how did the i'm yeah, actually dead, gonna dead get stitz on the phone here in a week or so i'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this one up to him I just, I'm 27, I discovered that, I don't know, about 10 years ago, and that's a very diverse split between the two of you, like, how did that split come to be? Um, 
we did a few shows together. And we got on to play. So I was a play with left over crack. Um, whose idea was it? It might have been Sturgeon's idea to like do a cover of each other's songs and then build that up from there and just add them to our new releases and then just do a co-release together because you know the fan bases as the, as the word is we're kind of separate we were in one we were the old dinosaur scar punkers <laughs> and they were the new upstart generation or whatever and we just thought it'd be a good mix it would get each other's crowds a bit more into each yeah. other which kind of did work um yeah, it's very diverse, you know. But I, I diversity is good. I will admit that I cracked up a few times when I when you when you sing Claire Channel Fuck Off and you see and you say yeah. Brittany Nickel back in the POD, to hear you say those those um I don't know if you want to call them bands or not, but if you want to, when to hear you mention those American pop acts, it is I mean I Stitza says that he's angry, but the way you do it it kinda of cracks me up because it's Wow, Dick Lucas of the Subhumans just said Nickelback. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it's just an accent thing. No, I, I just, it's because of, I don't know, I didn't even know that, I've known Leftover Crack for like 20 years now, and it's not that I've never known the lyrics of the song, it's just, you know how sometimes you mishear lyrics? I even was surprised that he even name-dropped them, but... I, I just I just like how you've put your DNA onto those leftover crack songs and they've put their DNA onto your songs and it's kind of there's a bunch of YouTubers I watch. It's good, for, it's good fun doing it, taking taking somebody else's music and uh, sort of adapting it a little bit to your own style. And Phil came up with the old crash, like that. It's like yeah, this is the most crash sounding song we've ever done because we never usually play with that beat and it was fucking ace fun. Another thing I wanted to bring up is, and you do this in a lot of your subhuman songs, I'm a, I'm more into hardcore punk than ska, which I do love Fish and Culture Shock, but in some of your songs, you'll make what I want to call a, oh, I'm trying to come up with that verse real quickly, but you'll make a, you'll make a noise like, you'll make these silly little noises after a verse. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, who's, who's making this noise? You do like it's in it's in some of your subhuman songs like you'll finish a verse then you'll be then you'll be like wow you'll just make a goofy noise and it cracks me up sometimes. I think in the song Are we talking a vocal noise? Yeah, I think somebody's voice. I think in the song Parasite or no, it's the song Animal. There's one track where you uh, after you're done with the verse you just go yeah 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 yeah. Just like that. I don't know if it's you or if it's someone else in the band, but my best friend to even yeah, notice. Yeah, I can't remember what, what song. I can't even remember that happening in some song. But then it's hard to describe noises, or is it on the phone? <laughs> is it yada, 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 like that? I'd have to play a sample, <laughs> but I'm in the library, but... Um, I know, but basically, there's a, there's a good chance that after a song, going like, hey, or whoop, or whatever, it's just going to happen in the studio. And then sometimes we just kept those bits in, or just the old word that people were saying sort of leave in between the songs it makes it sound like it's actual humans yeah, making the music when when I mean that's not on every song but like some songs like it's at the end of a verse or at the end of a song you'll be like yo yo it's uh, <laughs> I find it entertaining <laughs> well at least we've got something that's memorable <laughs> yes it, it actually really does help make your band really memorable because you're listening to a serious like reason for existence you're listening to the song that's very serious and makes you, well, from a young age, that song for the longest time was my favorite song by the Subhumans because what's your reason for existence? Do you believe in anything? Does your lifestyle contradict the words you write for the songs you sing? That really just uh -huh. drilled in my head at a young at a young age and really helped me to think not just songwriting but is what I'm doing making a positive, am I, am I going in the right direction? Is yeah. what I'm doing making a positive well, I mean, impact in my life? Well, that's good. I mean, I wrote that, those lines are basically addressed to myself. Um, you know, I'm asking myself, what's my reason for existence? That's why it says the songs you write, the words you write for the songs you see. It's like talking about somebody writes songs, i.e. me, there and then, asking myself, am I making any difference doing this stuff, you know? Um, and they're like, Fuck it, I wrote it, it rhymes, stick it out there. It's self-expression. If you hold yourself back, 
then you're never going to get across to anybody. But if you let yourself go like that, then people can sort of resonate along with it. And that's what songs are about, I think. Making some resonance with other people. Yes, and uh, your band, uh, of all the bands from the UK, I gotta say Subhumans are definitely the ones that have made the biggest impact on my life. Aside to, have you ever played a show with Crass? No. Oh. They didn't do many shows anyway. Um, oh, they did Before didn't. they split up in 84. And um, when they did, no, I mean, it was, oh, uh, maybe a dozen, two dozen. Huh. Uh, I don't know, I wasn't at any of them. They, you'd, find, you'd find out about Crass gigs sort of on the grapevine about one or two days before it happened because um, they were basically stopped from playing a lot of places they didn't want to play commercial venues so if they were very DIY with, in terms of the venue and who was putting it on and if they just want the, the local punks to find out about it but too many people would attract too much attention that sort of thing um, so no I missed all of them there was, there was about two of them were around this area within like 50 miles of here but I found out about it like the week after or whatever Interesting. Yeah, I've uh, I've uh, written to Andy T and a few of the other uh, artists who run Crass Records has uh, been trying to get them on the phone. Some of them are no longer with us anymore, fortunately. But uh, I uh, I see from the. Can you describe the '80s UK punk rock scene? Because although I've been listening to punk for twenty odd years, the UK scene just a. Uh, would you say it's more politically charged culturally or what would like American hardcore is just about nihilistic obliteration like Black Flag and all them bands just obliterate the set yeah. and I see more political and social change meaning coming from a lot of UK punk bands like what was the scene like back then and now if you uh, go to the show it was, it was, it was very diverse um, basically to simplify it a bit uh you start off with like punk rock stars with the pistols and all this like basically non-political confrontational angry and fun all mixed up but basically non-political then out of that came two sorts of music more or less to simplify it you've got bands like the Toy Dolls Toy that Dolls. exploited and you've got bands like Crass and Antisect and dare I say Subhumans so on the one hand oh, there was also little offshoots like New Wave and then the Goths turned up and all you know Everything just got influenced by punk rock, and so it remained in our heads as punk rock, and the rest of it was just dance music or whatever. But um, there was a time where the scene, as looked at through the music press, around right about, I don't know, 82, 83, or whatever, was starting to be divided up into like crass bands, or basically non crass bands, <laughs> uh, street level bands. Oi bands started coming in. Um, the journalists, they like to put labels on bands, and that kind of split the scene up a little bit, at least in our head. Oh. Um, so it's fine. Yeah, there's a lot of scareheads and violence from the Oi bands, whether the Oi bands thought they had flapper or not. And I would just start a bit nasty when the edges. Uh, the crash bands were fired by people from the outside were all dressing exactly the same wearing a load of black clothing and being pretty adamant about that and seemingly not having much fun I mean from the inside it's different than that I've, I've, we were having a lot of fun being angry and connecting with people who were being angry but from the outside it seemed a bit cliquey and the always scene from the outside seemed a bit violent so there's always perspectives going around that were spitting the punk scene roughly into two halves uh, not that we there was no like Oi, crass band fighting going on, just like you're wary of where the other type of punk oh, stood in the imagination of the crowd who was coming along to see it. Uh, and then you had Napalm Death and Discharge, you spared everything up completely. There's, that's just another split off. That was, that was brilliant, that was amazing. Now, they were neither Oi or crass, like a bit of this and a bit of that, but like suddenly the speed of punk got diverse as well. Suddenly it was up to a certain. Well, all the time it'd be up to a certain speed, and then discharge and napalm death especially just took it in double the speed. Right, now you've got double the speed and way shorter songs. That was a development. And since then, woo, there was the American influence of bad religion. Um, there was do, 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 the golf punk scene. I mean, yeah, all sorts going on. But from where we were, there was a lot of anarchy centers. 
there was a lot more fanzines coming out, giving people information they couldn't get anywhere else. There was a lot more political awareness. Uh, we were going through Margaret Thatcher and actually My... was based on the post industry, privatise everything, um, lock up the poor, make the rich even richer, uh, destroy industry and start chasing down all the free thinkers. The Stone Age were closed down by the cops in 1985. Um, yeah, it was like a bit of a culture war uh, against all these people who thought they could just rip the system off. Uh, the Tories got, the, you know, Thatcher's lot, just got pissed off. And they were just brutal. Conservative party, they all just rich fuckers. You know, they are offspring of rich, other rich fuckers, and money and power is all they care about. Um, so, yeah, we were going through Thatcher's, which was the first serious fucked up government for in terms of what fascism did for a while before it just like tottered along and then fascism just brought it all home and made it shit for a lot of people. Um, so we had that to fight against, the thing, usual thing, nuclear war, CND, were up on the march and gained a lot of consciousness, animal rights gained a lot of credence and in, in, the information travelling around about animal rights was enormous. Uh, a lot of people became vegetarians in the 80s, whereas it was almost impossible to eat anything out of a shop in the 70s if you were a veggie. Um, yeah, there was a progress of thought at the same time as the more shit was being realised that was going on uh, well, in the world, generally. I mean, all this shit was going on, you know, animals were being tortured and slaughtered in, the, say, the 50s, and there was nuclear, a threat of nuclear war in the 70s, the 40s or whatever, but... During those decades, the protest against it didn't make any sort of cultural mark that we could identify with, apart from the hippies made a bit of a mark in the late 60s. Um, apart from that, the anger wasn't really there, I think. It wasn't really there until Punk Rock came along. Interesting. And, I was going to yeah, ask another... Oh, sorry. Defining our problems. Yeah, Carol. I was going to ask another political no, question no. here. Is... Is there freedom of speech in the UK? Is there freedom of speech? Yeah, I've been... That's a simple question. I mean, it's hard to say yes and hard to say no. I mean, there's freedom of speech for those who want to, like, make an effort to protect it. And by that, I mean getting a harder, hard, harder call on the people who are being Nazis and using free speech, their freedom of speech, to about the most disgusting racist isolationist nationalistic bullshit since fucking Nazi Germany that's what's going on the last few years you've got Trump doing it over there we've got Johnson doing it over here um, they'll use the excuse of free speech to ram home a whole bunch of hate now I think we should use our free speech to silence that fucking hate or at yeah. least let it out in certain places I know it's like how far do you tell people to shut up well you don't but when do you have to start telling people to shut the fuck up? Because it's damaging the fucking... Society. Societies we live in. Yeah, you I know, it, will, it will lead. If enough, people, if enough people believe in this shit, we will be led to a state where people are just let the fuckers roll over us with fascism and extreme racism, and the poor will suffer, and anyone who's not white or rich will basically suffer. And if part of the process of stopping that is like fucking locking down, shutting down, closing down the public access that these hate mongers have gained. Yeah. You know, Twitter do it, they close down accounts, Facebook might do it, they get down to it by closing down accounts. That sort of thing is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about locking people up and shit. Just free speech is free because we stop people who want it to be curtailed for speaking out that way. That's what the fucking formula is. You use the free speech to protect free speech in general, well, not to get rid of it. What I meant was, I've got some friends in the UK, uh, primarily England, Northern Ireland, and uh, Scotland, who um, have told me that, unlike in America, where we have the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights that guarantees their freedom of speech, that in the UK, there is no Bill of Rights that has a guaranteed freedom of speech. And they've agreed with you that yeah, well, that's just, that's, I think you guys are relying way too much on those old bits of paper. Oh. Uh, we haven't got a constitution. We haven't got any... Yeah, sorry. We haven't got a constitution. 
we haven't got it written down into law, but notions of free speech are just like older than writing itself, you know what I mean? Um, to have it written down in a constitution, it lends it some legal force. I'll give you, I'll give you that much. Uh, there's a lot of people over there who, for whom your constitution means more than the Bible yes. or the Quran or <laughs> any, anything else has been written down. Um, you know, especially when it comes to the Second Amendment and all the guns shooting and shit, it's just like, no, Second Amendment, Constitution, we own the fucking right to kill whoever we want, to retain our freedom of fucking killing whoever we want. <laughs> um, yeah, this country, yeah, the Bill of Rights right is the backbone, it's essentially. Not written, it's not written, it's, well, it's not written down over here, but uh, that doesn't matter, it's, it's still a vital freedom, isn't it? Well, that's good there, I just, uh, I've heard so many different uh, views and perspectives and I've heard so many different things about it and I know you're from there you've lived there your whole life and I just figured I would ask you that since you are a lot more politically aware than most of the people that I know over there so I figured you would give the best answer and thank you for that answer because now I understand it better now yeah, I, no, I didn't think no worries, no worries. I mean ask, ask well, I, really. I mean I'll get a bit philosophical about it but I mean I'll ask you some you know, huh? basic factual questions I might have some facts <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's why I said your music has made an impact on me because you're just, you're very intelligent, you're well-spoken, even when you're screaming at the top of your lungs in a song, I still get the message. <laughs> and that's what I love about the well, sub uh, Thank you very much. Who, uh, who did the oh, artwork yeah. on, huh? Hello? No, nothing, it's just, uh, Oh, I said, who did the artwork for the day the country died and time flies, aeroplanes crash. <laughs> like, uh, you mean the same sort of art? Time, time flies. Like, you mean, oh yeah, the rats, rat CP, and even the CP and day the country died, were all done by a chap called Nick Land. Um, one day back in the dark days of 1982 or three, he wrote me a letter as people used to write letters, which is what's called when you put a pen next to a piece of paper. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just explain it. <laughs> um, I love you, Nick. <laughs> where are they? You wrote a letter. I just asked him for some info. You, know, you wrote to bands and asked for some info. And they said, you know, send me anything. What have you got? And the bottom of this letter was a little one-inch high picture of a punk rocker's head with a, you know, ring through the nose and uh, Moeek and, and all that. And it was, like, done in really fine pen. It was like, wow, that looks really good. At that point, we were stuck for a cover for the Religious Wars EP. That was the first thing he did. Um, so I said to him, brilliant drawing, is there any chance you could do a drawing that fits these lyrics? So I sent the lyrics to Religious Wars and thought nothing of it. And then, like, two weeks later, the Religious Wars cover comes through in the post. It's just like, oh, my God, wow, this is awesome. Um, so that started a, a path upwards to asking him to do the um, David Country Died cover which he took more weeks over, obviously, because it's a lot more detailed than that. Um, and at one point, he drew the punk who's getting shot through the head with a mohawk. And I said, um, could you make it just spikes all over? Because <laughs> if it's a mohawk, then that's just one specific haircut. And punk rock is, if there's one generalized punk rock haircut, it's spiky. So just, yeah. So he did that. That was my only, like, niggle okay. with it. And, um, yeah, fucking hell, wild cover. Then he did Rats, um, and then he did a Disappearing Act. Nobody knew where he went. He wasn't replying to letters. He couldn't be gained, um, couldn't be access, uh, reached, is the word, because um, we wanted to um, see if we could do something like that. Yeah, time Flies or Worlds Apart. That was it. Worlds Apart was the next one. Nick, dude, if he did that, would be great. Hang on, he did. I'm losing myself in my own brain. He did do the inside picture inside Worlds Apart LP. Of course he did. Take account, folks. This all happened to me 40 years ago. So, I, you know, give, give an old punk a break. Ha! Um, did he done, did he done. Anyway, so he did the Worlds Apart years like and then he did a disappearing act and vanished. Um, oh, shit. Never to be seen again. Except recently, there's a chap who writes books about punk rock called Ian Glasper. He's started off on a mission to do a book about subhumans, during which he's been in contact with all sorts of people who are connected with it, and also the the artist. So he's going to do an interview with him at some point and ask him about the art of that, nice. and find out where he's been for the last, you know, 39 years or whatever. 
but yeah, amazing artist. You know, completely one of those like uh, yeah, yeah. things. You need a cover. We're all crap at art, and then this picture comes in the post, and it's really good when things like that sort of happen naturally. You know. Yeah, you're, and that. the artwork on the Subhumans albums are just there's the like when you put the when you have the record in your hand you can listen to the music and there's just so much to look at on the cover it's just like it, there's just so much there I I also wanted to yeah ask, well I mean, huh oh go ahead yeah, I mean, yeah looking at covers is part of, part of what you do when you listen to an album I mean, you don't want to look at anything else because you get distracted from the music. But you don't just stare at a record player for half an hour or whatever, so you might as well read the cover. If you have enough weed, you can. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> one of my favorites, another favorite song by the Subhumans, which I'm assuming you're just, you're the only one who has done this. What is, is this, the song Susan, the piano song? Oh, yeah. Uh, what's the story behind that? I mean, I, I know what this, I get what the song's about, and I actually have highly related to it before, unfortunately, but... Yeah, you mean, what the fuck is he doing on a piano? <laughs> <laughs> um, good point. Um, well, we had a friend called Steve Hamilton, he was just, you know, local mate, and he'd written this song, and he wasn't in a band, he said, do you want these lyrics? I thought, oh, it looks, uh, that's different, about a woman called, about an individual coming through, just like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And I had this kind of, I had this piano, I like playing piano. That's it's the only instrument I like playing. I'm reasonably good at it. And so I had this tune, and I just uh, put the lyrics to that. Um, just worked out, you know, do these, this many verses, then do a bit of a piano lead break, or whatever you call it, and then back to the last two verses or whatever. And um, so I then got that together. I then recorded the piano on. Bruce's grandmother's piano. Bruce's Bruce's own guitar guitarist. His grand, who he's living with, could play any music, like from memory or from off the page, or whatever. She was like, when yeah, she was young and she was like, yeah, she could just play piano for a living. It was brilliant. Anyway, she had a really good piano, and I was a bit of crap piano. So anyway, I found the notes, and then Bruce had one of these really old style cassette recorders. You, know, you press play, play, and record at the same time. I just get the cassette going off we go ready yeah it's on okay start playing it do 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 right I was so about the tenth attempt I got through to the end so I thought right that's good enough because I've reached the end we took that into the studio and then sang over it uh, Bruce added on a bit of percussion in the background a couple of bass notes uh, a bit of guitar going real feedback or something like that and yeah, that was that. It was very odd indeed. It's just like, shall we do it? There's no one can think of a reason not to do it. So we did. Yeah, I gotta say, it's a that's a very hard-hitting song. And I used to work at American Eagle as a packer. I just put clothing in bags for 10 hours a night. And there'd be many nights where that song just... The feeling of never being able to get where you want to go, you're never happy, and everybody else around you saying, we know what's best for you, take pills, get rest, you're going to be fine, and you're like, no, I'm not going to be fine. And Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, it's a kind of realistic and bleak at the same time. Your music is just very, is just very um, blunt. And I, uh, another thing I was going to mention is, I've noticed with the subhumans, from beginning to crisis point, you your, your band has evolved in a way that like uh, your earlier stuff is fitting more towards you know it fits the climax of back then plus it resembles now and then in 2007 internal riot that album fits the time period and then you do it again in 2020 with crisis point you're really good at taking you're really good at grabbing everything around you that's happening and still keeping the subhumans the way that you know the subhuman sound but evolving them like uh well i mean in a sense i mean it's hard to disagree with a compliment like that and thank you very <laughs> much but thinking about it time flies not time flies split vision at the end of our where we just split um side one was the very old stuff that we hadn't done on the record yet like you know the the, the backlog of stuff unused as so far and then side two was so new that we'd never played it live so you've got a right picture there. And Site 2 was very 
well, what do you call it? Progressive punk or something. It was very odd indeed. I, I don't think I've actually heard Split uh, Vision. It wasn't, it wasn't usual whatsoever. I was, yeah, I, I know. When we got round to performing and doing Internal Riot, that was a step um, back to where we were before Split Vision. Um, you know, it's got more in common with Worlds Apart than Split Vision, whatever. And then I think Crisis Point, because we only had a limited amount of time to practice and record because by this point our drummer Trotsky's living in Germany we're still we're all still in England so we don't get a practice weekly or anything like that um crisis point there was so much weird shit going on that the lyrics and the music were all created relatively quickly oh. and at least half the songs on that album were never played live by the time we recorded it so that adds an extra sort of rawness to it, um, which you could compare all the way back to, I don't know, the, the early EPs in terms of <coughs> complicated music. It was quite simplistic in a sense. So we didn't add too many complications in it because we didn't have time to work the songs out to the point where, oh, if we just did that there and then change that bit to there and then go back like that. You know, the quirky stuff didn't really get added in. It didn't have time to evolve that much. So what you got is a more basic set of tunes and yeah I think it's a, it's a good thing it fits the time it came out in I mean, 2019 by compared to now it was just like some wonderful time of life but like you know it was also mid Trump and Tory party so it was pretty shit even before the lockdown yeah. you know, there's a lot lot going wrong with the planet and there always will be I just want to mention that I'm not always a miserable sod who moans about everything all the time <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, me and my best me and my best friend Chad. We like to make the joke that um the subhumans are the angry Dick Lucas and fish and sh- culture shock are the happy Dick Lucas. Oh, yeah, we, we make we make well, that we yeah, make, okay. He listens I mean, to more. <laughs> he listens to more fish. Huh? Say again? Oh, I said he listens to more fish and culture shock. I listen to more of the subhumans, which is why I keep mentioning them more. I'm just, uh, I'm into, like, a lot of hard, hardcore punk and noise rock, like Subhuman, Sonic Youth, Bad Religion, Dead Kennedys, uh, Melt Banana. I don't know if you know Melt Banana yeah. or not, but, um, I will say, Culture, sh- uh, I have the Attention Span CD, and you have a lot of experimental guitar, uh, tremblings and stuff like that within the songs, which do make Citizen, which do make the songs on that particular album stand out to me a bit more. I don't have it. I haven't heard everything by Fish, but I've heard Life Size. Or no, was it Life Size or Super Size? Uh, Life Size. Life yeah. Size, Attention Span. That's, that's the only Fish I've heard. And then the Culture Shock have Onwards and Upwards. I love that album. Right. <laughs> it's just a very, it's very uplifting. And uh, um, were there any other bands you were ever a part of? Or are those just three? Uh, I was in a band before something was called The Mental. The Mental? <laughs> the Mental, yeah. What's the story on that one? Uh, well, we all formed at school and uh, split up when we left school. And we were pretty awful. We had about 20 songs, including a few <laughs> a few cover versions. Uh, you know, I Feel All Right was one of them. Uh, we did, I did, did a French version of Paranoid. Um, a French you know, version the, of like, Paranoid? Paranoid. The, 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 Dick, the Dickies covered it. We thought, I wasn't going to do that. And we did it in French. Oh my God. It kind of rhymed, almost. We, we played it twice. Um, we were pretty awful. It was the first thing, first music we'd ever anyone had played. So we were like learning how to play guitars and stuff at the same time as playing them and doing gigs. And it, it didn't matter that we were terrible. We put a record out, had four songs on it. Uh, the, uh, the DJ John Peel played one song off it twice, which is like, yay, result. Uh, John Peel was right on the BBC, he was a late night DJ who played everything first, everything alternative would be first heard on John Peel, including the entirety of Punk Rocket, etc. Um, yeah, the good band. Um, yeah, it was messy, we did about 10 gigs, and then split up, and then things evolved into wherever I'm next, which is, for me, was the subhumans. Oh, yeah. On the song 
and on the uh, song Animal, it's about a college student who obviously parents think he's going the wrong direction. I love how you describe it in the song how they took they, they opened his head up, took out a part of his brain, put in a new brain and left the old part in there and then he just snapped after a while, like is that a is that song a reference <laughs> to someone you know, or is that just uh or did you just write that one? I'm sorry, that's got no sorry, that's not that's not a reference to anybody. I'm sorry, well, it's just totally made up, uh, written on the in the back seat of a bus. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> work it, was just, it, was, it was the thoughts in my head were something to do with like you know you go to school then you're supposed to go to university you know, that's the next step up and that sort of thing and just how society basically replaces part of your brain but in this case it doesn't work you just go insane at the end of it so instead of becoming like a normal citizen whoever it is in the soul just like wigs out as you say and goes mental <laughs> In the UK, and this is this, now we're finally getting into some citizen fish here. In the UK, uh, I've never been there before, but I know in the United States, mom and pop shops pretty much get destroyed by Price Chopper, Walmart, and you know the conglomerates. Is that a? I know yeah. you talk about the supermarket forces. Is that song primarily about supermarkets coming in and destroying mom and pop shops? Is that a really a? Uh, how yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that is. They're destroying everything. They're destroying the ability of farmers to produce things at the supermarket stop because the supermarkets insist that they've got to sell because to the supermarket at such a low price that the farmers can't actually afford to pay the workers who are growing the produce. So the farmers get closed down. The bigger farmers survive because they make enough to cover it and they get to more smaller shops, but they maybe. They need to sell at the supermarket in order to cover their costs. The supermarket will pay the minimal amount it can um, to undercut all the small stores that are selling the same products at a reasonable price for them to ex exist and survive. And because people... Oh, hello? I'm here, I'm here. I'm listening. Okay, the phone just... Be... Actually, hang on. Y'all good? Okay, yeah, my dad's ringing me up. Um, oh. <laughs> okay, I'll ring him back later. I, I'm also on a low power, though, so I'll plug this phone in. Give me 10 seconds. Right. I'm here still. Oh, shit. 12%. Okay. I won't keep it much longer. I just got a few more for you. Well, I just, I just want to do a bit of... Um, Oh, let's see if I can actually sit upright and still talk while the phone's plugged in. Which doesn't make good radio, does it? Uh, <laughs> oh, it's video, even. Funk it's rock, on, man. It's, it's on YouTube, isn't it? Well, it's not on YouTube yet. I'm, re not, I'm recording it with my... But I mean, it, yeah, but I mean, it will be. Yeah, it will YouTube. be at some point when I get around to it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the idea did, did come up of doing a sort of uh, Zoom visual chat thing but this way, I reckon, people would be uh, impelled to keep listening and stop looking. I mean, we look at so much in this culture of ours. Everything's so visual that people actually stop listening to what people are actually saying. Good point. I mean, it's fucking sound bites. Good point, and actually. Sound bites and, you know, and everybody just got, if you, if you can't be seen, you won't be heard sort of thing. Hence the rise of Facebook and Instagram and, yeah, I was gonna make a, I was gonna make a little uh, reference to it to a little joke you made. Uh, I watched a show. I think you played at the Riot House in Kansas City or somewhere. But um, a bunch of people. You were on the stage. You're you're well. You weren't playing yet. You were trying to play. But um, a bunch of people pulled yeah. their little iPhones out and started uh, you know, filming you and taking selfies and all that. And, all right. and you made the comment. You know what the difference is between today and ten years ago. I didn't have a bunch of fucking phones in my face. <laughs> oh, I hate going to shows and everyone's just got their little phone out and it's like, are we here to be stupid? Are we here to listen to the music? It's like, I, I get like taking a picture with the band after the show, but like when they, especially when they got all the little flashlights on and they're waving them, I'm like, ugh. Yeah, I mean, the whole point, I mean, what, what is the point of filming something to watch later on if you could just watch it now? Yes. I don't know, maybe they maybe they want to watch it twice later on, but the point is, it'd be a live event. 
Well, not just that, but... It's all be live, really. I mean, a yeah, couple of photos, maybe, maybe it's on one song, but some people are just there all night. You know, it's just like... I well, think they've missed the point a little bit. Well, not just that, but phones are terrible at recording loud music. <laughs> That's pretty well, yeah, much they're, what they're you get on a phone. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why would you Why would you go to see the subhumans record it just for it to sound terrible? Enjoy them there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm a little bit more conservative on that, but I just, I, I'm from a small town in Kansas, and I don't get to see, I mean, now I get to see bands whenever I want, usually, but growing up, I didn't have that liberty, and so when I did get that liberty... I mean, all you, you got to do, basically all you got to do is like rely on somebody filming the whole thing and sticking it on YouTube yeah. later on, they can watch it later on, and then just jump around down the front at the time. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be some... Like, if you don't see it later, go, go see the band another time. And that's what, you know, that's what bands do. They keep playing because people keep coming to see them. If people see one show and record it all and think, right, well, I never had to go watch them again because I've got it forever on my bloody phone. But rah, 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 rah. Technology destroys culture, part 26. The second part of that question, though, is when you're on stage and you have a million little phone lights blinding your eyes, like, I couldn't imagine just... You just want to take a phone and smash it. Like, I don't know if you listen to Slipknot or not, but Corey Taylor from Slipknot once took someone's phone and kicked it because they were pointing it right at him as he was trying to play his music and he couldn't see, so he just drop kicked the phone. Like, have you ever had an incident where you're so blinded you can't see that you're like, put the damn thing down or, you know, anything like that? No, I basically just avoid looking at whatever it is pointing at me. And it's never got to the point where it was so annoying. I had to say, say "Could you not do that?" You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I can tolerate a lot because I'm too busy singing to be really interested to the point of obsession about what whatever people are pointing at me. You know what, <laughs> I mean? what it is or whatever. It's just like if I become too over aware of cameras, I start freaking out about being photographed or filmed then that's going to ruin everything so I basically until someone starts throwing stuff I generally just get on with it oh throwing throwing stuff have you ever uh, <laughs> is, is that a common is that a common occurrence <laughs> throwing stuff well, throwing stuff have a have uh, a... no it's rare I, I, I want to keep it that way <laughs> I, I agree <laughs> I agree have the sub humans I mean there used, there used to be a time there was a time where people were actually gobbing at the singer, you know, spitting on them. Oh, that really sucked. Yeah, it's uh, it's a long it's long ago now. Well, thank God, you know, punk has at least evolved that much, and people have stopped spitting at each other. That's disgusting. Like, yeah, I'm not trying to be a sissy, but that's just filthy. You can get diseases that way. I'm sure even grown tough men don't like being spat at. Yeah, they just like to do the spitting. Uh, um, another record I wanted to bring up real quickly: Subhumans Live in a Dive. Where was a? Uh, I I bought oh, yeah. that. I bought that at Rasputin Records in 2013. Uh, I know Fat Mike thinks a lot of you. He's uh, complimented your music a billion times in interviews. You're one of his biggest inspirations, and he always wears that little black pink top Subhuman shirt. Local. Oh, I need a Subhuman shirt. But um, you you uh you and Fat Mike pretty good friends still. You uh have any plans with him in the future? And how did the Life in a Dive uh album? How did uh, tell me the story behind that, please? So what's the first part of that question? You the phones are buying rings. The the Life in a Dive on Fat Records. How did that album come to be? Yeah. Uh, that came to be because, as you say, Fat Mike is a a big fan, and um, uh. He was doing a series of live and dive releases and wanted us to do one. And so we set it up for Fat to come along and record a gig we did at the Showcase Theatre um, in Corona, California. And which is great because it's like totally the best venue we ever played ever. We played there about five or six times. They were always fantastic shows. So that was an advantage doing it there. He had like 21 microphones on the pan Holy and above shit. the crowd. It's like 21, it's just like, that's an insane amount of microphones. So everything was recorded really well. Damn. Um, and yeah, I mean, 
the fuckers, they made us do a sound check of the entire set. So we played the whole set like twice that night. Oh one God. for a sound check and one for real. It's like, you really want to play the whole lot? I think in the end we talked them down to half an hour of it. But just so they could get the sound levels right and that. They had like a sound recording set up in a van parked out the back of the venue. It was pretty high tech stuff. So would you say working with Fat Which Mike and Fat like, Records was more? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Huh? I said so. Would you would you would you agree that working with Fat Mike and Fat Records was a? Uh, it sounds like they they do more of a professional type of job than just uh, DIY street in it. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, Fat Mike he's made a lot of money off No Effects. He puts it back into releasing further records. So, I guess if he can afford the top quality recording setup to get a top quality recording then that's what he did and that's the sort of thing he does um, and good on him for that yeah they were all, Fat Records are very organised oh, um, yeah. together and approachable and all that sort of stuff do you uh, plan on any? are the Subhumans going to be releasing any records after Crisis Point any plans on that uh, no I mean, we didn't plan to do Crisis Point. It's just that we got to the point where we could do another record, so we did. I mean, it's an unspoken plan to do, make as many records as possible because that involves creating new songs and keeping the creative thing flowing as much as possible. And then an album is the end result of making up new songs. So that's the general plan. Um, most of the time, we haven't got any new songs, or we've got very few. Uh, because we don't live in the same country, so get, put it this way, getting new songs together is a slow process. Yeah. Um, hence the, the gap between, I mean, Internal Riot was 2007, Crisis Point was 2019, there's a 12 year fucking gap there, people are born and die in that time. <laughs> Shit. It's not fast enough, but at least it's better than nothing at all. 2019 and 2020 gave me at least a, uh... Like three different records that I never imagined, like uh, Crisis Point f- from you, and then Alphabet Land in 2020 by X, and then Dirty Rotten Imbeciles. It was either 2018 or 2019 they came out with an EP, but three bands that I, that I hadn't heard anything from in almost 20 years, or, or just a long period of time, came out with, with new records, and that's why the last few years for me musically were just wonderful, and I'm really glad that you guys made that album. Thank you. Yeah, well, the, the lockdown has been a time where some bands have used it to create new songs and make new records. Yeah, including, um, including myself. <laughs> you know, things, things... Huh? I said, yeah, including myself. Oh, good on you. Yeah, I, I was telling you earlier, no, no, I'm a... Cold Shot made a new... I'm a noise artist. Cold Shot made a new record. Huh? Oh, we're both talking at once here. So, um... Ready, t- go. So, uh, tell me real quickly, um, what is this Blurg TV um, thing that you advertised on Inst- on your IGTV the other day? I know you said to submit things, but what's the uh, what's the whole thing? The whole thing is that we were all locked down and there was no gigs going on and shows were going on, that is. And it was like, you could, we were in the studio with Culture Shock and like, my partner Michelle was filming us. Um, she said, you know, this could, this is like, you know, get out on YouTube or something, uh, just to let people know we're still active and playing. And um, so there in the idea of Blur TV came up, you know, there's Blur Records in yeah. order. And Blur TV just seemed a, a good step. We had a few old, um, old footage films that she'd made of, for a series of this songs on her own site and so we moved those onto the newly founded Blue TV now it's dead easy to set up a channel on YouTube anyone can do it it's free yeah. and so we we did it and then um, the first thing that got people into knowing it existed was when we did uh, we streamed uh, a live gig with Cold Shock and RDF and Atacot playing in a local venue like a DIY style venue yeah. called Rockaway Park which is itself a whole 20 minute conversation it's an amazing place uh, very DIY very helping people out and so we had three bands played there we recorded it properly they played to like you know eight people it was all like you know social distancing no crowds are allowed to get and so on and so on 
And um, we, well, we had like 2,000 people watching that on a Saturday night. Jesus. And from that point on, we've managed to put up three different things every week, and that was back in uh, end of September. So at the moment, we've got about 130 things up. We're doing three a week. We've got Poets Cor- Punk Poets Corner, for those people who can't play anything but still got the words about them, they become poets and they do a little bit of poetry. Um, we got bands doing lockdown style music from their, each other's living rooms and putting that together. We got bands uh, playing live, like pre lockdown recordings of shows, which is good. Some are pretty old, you know, so some go right back to the early 80s, but not many. Most of it is up to date and happening now. Um, then there's uh, Punk Suit Paint, which is where people who paint can get up there and talk about painting, their own painting, why they got into it, what they paint, how they paint, what it means to them. Um, and painting or printing, or we got Andy doing a bit of wood turning. I mean, anything where non corporate people, which is like almost everybody, yeah. um, are doing something off their own backs that's like interesting, creative or musical, which is a pretty broad um, amount of stuff. DIY goes all over the place. And, yeah, it's working well so far. I was, I was asking... We're always, we're, always looking for new, we're always looking for new stuff to put on it. So anyone who does anything interesting, uh, curious or musical, or spoken word or whatever, that you know, at least makes sense, doesn't offend people, whatever, um, send your ideas to blurgtv at gmail.com yeah that's what I was trying to get at there is I uh I was thinking about I don't have any music videos because I'll just explain my musical life real quick to you since you just told me all yours um I'm 27 years old 28 in November and uh, I graduated high school in 2012 from a small town and then 2013 I moved to California to the Bay Area I formed a noise punk band called Vaginal Aftershock with a few friends. That was the band I had for about a year. And then in 2014, I moved back to Kansas to my best friend's basement. And then I didn't have a band anymore, but I had a, a brain full of good and bad ideas. <laughs> and I just started making right. my own uh, few years. I grew up on hardcore punk. And then in 2011, Chad, my best friend, showed me Sonic Youth. And I learned about noise. Oh. I learned about noise rock, and then I just combined the, just uh, I combined the idea of noise music with punk, and so in twenty in twenty fourteen I recorded my first ever solo stuff. Is uh, my earlier stuff was more noise rockish, but now I just um, I'm a noise artist, and I saw your video there, and I don't have any music videos, but I would totally love to either send you digital copies of my albums because I do own a, I own a micro record label, a cassette tape label, indie product. I, I've released yeah. one CD, but I thought about sending you some stuff to see it just so you could get a taste of it. My album is on YouTube, but I would really love yeah. to be a part yeah. of that. Yeah, well, yeah. Send, send me a link to it or whatever you got. Yay! I'll be happy to check it out. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I saw that and I was like, I need to be a part of this. Cause, and also... Another question that's totally unrelated to your music. I see your your artwork, your paintings, and your balancing of objects. How the hell do you balance objects like that? Oh, well. <laughs> that is just... Whoa. Um, yeah, that's a hard question to answer without demonstrating it. Um, how to do it? Well, you need a lot of patience. Um, and I'm not going to... You balance scissors no, between rocks. The main thing you need, really. You see, you soon learn when you balance this stuff what is going to work and what definitely isn't, uh, or at least what might work and what won't. And then you just get, you just get into it, and you find, oh fuck it, it's really hard to describe. <laughs> it's and, amazing um, to watch, though. <laughs> I enjoy. It's pretty dull to watch. There's people, people put videos up of it. They last like twenty minutes, and it's like they have, they're not moving. They've got two hands around this rock above this rock, above this rock, above that rock, and it's like they're not moving for 20 minutes, and then suddenly they take their hands away, and it's all, it all stays still. It's like, that's the level of intensity it gets, where a micro fucking millimetre is going to make the difference between balance and imbalance. 
it goes that deep. So most of the time, it's just a case of it's easier than that. It takes five or ten minutes. But uh, the really good balancers, and a chap called Gravity Glue on Instagram, uh, uh, his stuff is just fucking insane. You can spend hours <laughs> on it creating one thing. I'm gonna try fucking this. I, just, I'm, I am a mere, a mere amateur. I'm gonna try this stuff. I I just uh, I love your paintings and all that. And then I saw your balancing, and I'm like, how the hell does he do that? That's so. You got you got the the, the answer is you got to try it yourself. I'm gonna try it myself. I'm gonna try this after I get off of work go, tonight. That's, <laughs> that's some cra- like I've seen a lot of artwork in my life, but balance balancing scissors in between two rocks. What? <laughs> Like that's just, <laughs> that's just that skill. You have skill. You have a lot of talent and a lot of skill and patience to be able to do that. And if I smoke enough, there's uh, a certain you, amount. I'm sure there's a certain amount of luck involved. Oh, oh, of luck too. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Um, yeah, I would just want to advertise the fact that Culture Shock and you've got a new album out called Pandemic, and we just got a second pressing done. And uh, it'll be the last one, so and it's bloody good, honestly. We can't afford advertisers, so I pay myself to say it's bloody good. Don't you know? In my best English accent. So come on, folks. Whoever's watching this, go to cultureshockuk.bandcamp.com. Have a listen to a couple of songs or more, and buy a copy. Yes. Hey, thank you very much. If that works, thanks. Yes, that's that's. Uh... Definitely in, plug anything you have because your music is important. I'm so, it's what we got. I'm so happy. Culture Shock for the new record. Yes. So cool, cool, cool. Alrighty. And, uh, I'm, I'm Alrighty. Just, that's all I had. I hope you have a wonderful night. Right? Night? Night. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. You have a wonderful day and we'll be sorted. Yeah. And I will, uh, I'll send you a link to this once it's up and uh, I will write you an email I'll leave the blurring TV Gmail in the description of the video I'll uh, have it all set up for you and uh, thank you so much okay. for giving me your time man thank I you. really appreciate it hey no worries alright ciao ciao good one keep it up thanks Mhm. see you later see you later fucking awesome <laughs>